What's up guys, it's Dalm out of here and today we're going to be reacting to another Hoser video. So this one we've got Africa's North Korea, uh, which uh, I'm not sure what they mean by that. Maybe like just poor country or, uh, you know, totalitarian dictatorship. I'm not exactly sure what they mean by that. But anyway, link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. On November 17th, 1869, this small peninsula suddenly became a new global hotspot. Why? because a long ditch was dug through it, allowing ships to sail through this route instead of all the way around Africa. Almost overnight, the Red Sea became one of the most strategic regions on Earth to control, or at least have a presence in. One Italian navigation company did just that. They bought the port of Assab from local sultans just two days before the grand opening of the canal. That's Talk smart. about good timing. And today... Well, Assab is just a small city in the much larger country of Eritrea, sometimes called Africa's North Korea. Eritrea is an impoverished, highly militarized one-party state. It has been led by a single leader since independence in 1991 and has often been one of the bottom nations in terms of... Who, who did they get independence from? Italy? I can't, who, did, uh, who controlled Eritrea? Uh, I don't think it would have been Italy because they would have lost it after World War II if they did have it. Um, history. Oh, the the British. Okay, and then the, then the Ethiopians took it over. And both territories in letter to Franklin D. Roosevelt. Okay, so Ethiopia owned part of it. Okay. So it was, it was the, the Italians, then the British, then the Ethiopians. Human development. Not only does it have the second highest amount of active military reserves per capita, the country has mandatory conscription for both men and women starting from your last year of high school until whenever you're dismissed. Sometimes when you're 40, sometimes in your 50s. Yeah, damn. Take that in. That's basically your entire working life as a conscript in the military. Although many of them don't fight because of the unique way Eritrea's government commands its economy. Conscripts are not just used for war. They are quite literally the backbone of everything in the country. They build the country, run the services, administer it, and of course, defend Eritrea. All for very little pay, suffering abuse and harsh conditions in what is essentially a mass system of forced labor. It's no surprise then that Eritrea is also called the world's fastest emptying country because of how many citizens run away from it. Around 800,000 by 2023. That's in comparison to a home population of only 3.7 million, meaning almost one fifth of all people born in this land have left it. Oh, damn. Real attractive. But is Eritrea. I mean, they got North Korea beat there. At least they can leave. All right, well, I mean, I don't know if they're allowed to, but <laughs> at least they're physically able to. It's much more difficult in North Korea. Actually, like North Korea, that crazy hermit kingdom, I don't know. There are some key differences. For one, nukes. Eritrea does not have a nuclear weapons program and thus is much less of a threat than North Korea is. They don't have the capability to straight up destroy their neighbors if the military just feels like it one day. If you were to leave Eritrea, you could come back one day, although with some difficulties. Whereas if you leave North Korea, you're dead to them. Eritreans have a lot more exposure to the outside world through TV and the internet, although the majority still don't have access to them yet and both are still heavily monitored and regulated by the government. And lastly, Eritrean loyalty is meant to be to the nationalistic, triumphant Eritrean state and military, not to the family that runs it. Still. There are plenty of similarities. We'll run through. I find that very often these these things are worded differently, right? They're phrased differently, they're framed differently, but they function the exact same way, right? You, you know, for for example, right? Uh, North Korea is supposed to be a communist country, but it functions like an absolutist monarchy, right? And to some degree, every communist system does, right? Uh, now there are differences in the fact that, like, you know, in, in a lot of communist countries. You normally don't have a hereditary monarch, right? You don't have a hereditary ruler. Um, North Korea is kind of unique in that regard. Um, but generally, right, these are highly militaristic. They're, uh, you know, it, it's the, the the similarities you can run down the board. And they're, they're, you know, 
whether it's like you know this whether they they market themselves as like super right wing hyper nationalist or they market themselves as like super left wing communist they function essentially the same right once you get to these totalitarian types of government four that i think give you a good picture on the hows and the whys of africa's north korea first militarism Look at this fun parade, all the soldiers marching as one. What do you think they might do? Invade Ethiopia? Maybe even Djibouti? Um, I'm not sure, but I can say that Eritrea was a country made by war, even back in the Italian times. Originally, the Italians did not try to grow this dry and rocky colony that much. They wanted control over the fertile interior mountains in East Africa, but were defeated by Ethiopian armies in the 1890s. The land they did keep in Eritrea wasn't all that interesting to them, despite the prime seaside location. Interest came back with a change in government though. The new fascist Italy was obsessed with trying to reconquer Ethiopia. And where was their starting block to invade? Right here in Eritrea. Suddenly investment, infantry, and Italians flooded in. The new Italians brought workers to build up urban infrastructure and industry. And that's why Asmara still looks so Italian today and heavily subsidized the colony, bringing in the foreign goods and food they needed. But the, let's say, more conservative-minded fascist Italians also brought new laws with them. The new towns they built were built to be segregated. They limited Eritrean education to only up to the fourth grade, confiscated Eritrean cash crop farms, and conscripted and trained many citizens to help the fight against Ethiopia. This obviously didn't go over too well with the people, and it created an identity through a shared enemy. Otherwise, this linguistically, religiously, ethnically, and geographically diverse nation probably never would have come together. The newly trained Eritrean soldiers never rebelled against the Italians though because the colony was taken over by the British in World War II. The Brits also weren't really interested in administering Eritrea, especially when their empire was in the middle of collapsing. The most they really did was strip Italian-made assets and deport many of the fascist administrators who ran the colony. Many Italians left the colony in this period, so in the end, the UK and UN came to an agreement in 1952 to just make Eritrea an autonomous region of neighboring Ethiopia. Funny they did that. Even funnier when they were slowly annexed by the Ethiopian Empire, officially voting Eritrea out of existence in 1962. <coughs> Eritreans became second-class citizens in the empire. Independence leaders were harassed or killed, and political parties, the press, and unions were crushed under Ethiopian rule. So if you thought the rebellious military culture was made under fascist Italy, you were wrong. A 30-year war followed this. 30 years, yes, three decades. The final straw being the fact that they would no longer teach the majority language to Grinya in school, instead opting for Amharic, the language of the Ethiopian government. Resistance started off as a Muslim movement, but then spread to workers and spread even further to a general nationalist movement. Eventually, this movement split up with the most successful successor being the Eritrean People's Liberation Front. Fighting lasted through the Cold War with all of its shenanigans. It was decades of fighting, massacres, raisings, mass burnings, sometimes even between Eritreans. And as time went on, the Eritreans continued fighting in a way that the Ethiopians were getting tired of. Fighting alongside the Tigray PLF, funds and equipment dropping off at the end of the Cold War, and battles won in the mountains led to Eritrean victory and a declaration of independence in 1991. And now, everyone's happy and peaceful, the revolutionary fighters could now focus on governing their newly made country. The EPLF became the PFDJ, the People's Front for Democracy and Justice. What a <laughs> be. So did the <laughs> Yeah, it's, whenever you throw peoples in front of something, it's almost always, right, the, 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 the whole, the marketing is that it's going to be democratic. In reality, it's almost completely authoritarian. And it's actually funny because if you read a lot of, like, communist literature, it, this is actually, like, by design. Because, like, you, you can go down a, a massive rabbit hole with this. But, like, the, you know, they view, like, the, the true form of democracy is, uh, like, authoritarian. But it, it's, it's – just go down the massive rabbit hole if you want to. It's – oh, my God. It's so funny because people, people – like – you like you you think about it and you're just like this is this is so logically inconsistent. But then if you read their actual like their works and their writing, it's like okay, it makes sense why you think this, 
Uh, it's insane, but like at least I understand why you think this, right? It's it's very much like authoritarian cope. Fighting stop after independence. No, this is when they made their mandatory conscription, although for the time it was only 18 months long and didn't control their entire society. Most new government officials were commanders and officers in the fight for independence. They knew how to run an army, but not a country. After independence, Eritrea was involved in a small war with Yemen, the First Congo War, the Second Sudanese Civil War, a war in Djibouti, got sanctioned after that one, and a real doozy in Ethiopia from 1998 to 2000. You see, the TPLF eventually installed a government in Ethiopia, and even though they fought with the Eritreans for independence, the two movements did not get along. The government has always had this idea that the TPLF is trying to destabilize Eritrea and remove them from power. So relations between the countries soured throughout the 90s, the two countries stopped trading, had border skirmishes, and an outright war broke out in 1998 over the tiny village of Badme. Although it only lasted for two years, conflict between them was on and off for two decades until a formal peace treaty was signed with the new Ethiopian government in 2018. Hope! Not for long though. In 2020, they joined the Ethiopia Tigray civil war, fighting once again with their compatriots. Just kidding. They were fighting with Ethiopia against the TPLF again. They blocked food shipments from the sea, pillaged villages, murdered citizens, and even did this to their own Eritrean refugee camps. Why? All in an effort to officially crush the TPLF. So if you were to add up all the wars, all the people affected, moved, or killed by constant warfare in this tiny country, uh, it would be a lot of people. Eritrea was made by war. Second is power. I should tell you more about the government. In general, I guess you could call them paranoid, isolationist, and brutal with their punishments. Particularly, this guy is Isaias Afwerki. He's been leader for... He's been leader for... He's been... Man, at least as long as I can remember. <laughs> as long as anyone can remember. That's because if we're going off the perspective of the Eritrean nation, he's been president forever for 100% of the independent history. God damn. And don't rule a country since 1991 without having some typical dictatorial characteristics. He was a through and through military commander who became president. He spearheaded the war efforts, was paranoid about foreign powers, arrested opposition leaders, and arrested many of his own citizens for arbitrary and unknown reasons. One of the most common ways to do this was to detain dozens of people at a time inside of these shipping containers. Better pray it doesn't get too hot outside. Jesus Damn. Christ. These metal prisons get hot. We're talking potentially up to the 60s or 70s degrees Celsius, and this barely scratches the surface of all the torture and abuse the soldiers- They just fucking leave people in the shipping containers in the desert? So they're basically they're just like, yeah, you're dead. That's basically what they're saying. They're like, yeah, you're dead. Good luck. Have fun. Face. Maybe Isaias isn't a great dude. So if there was any point where all hope of a reasonable development plan was lost, it was definitely 1998, the militarization of society. The ongoing war with Ethiopia was an excuse to extend conscription from 18 months to, well, they just say indefinitely, but it's usually around 25 to 30 years of service, aka your whole working career in forced labor. Slowly the government eroded the powers of society and the people. Elections in 1997 were postponed to 2001 due to the war and then postponed again because part of the country was occupied at the time. I guess we're still waiting for this one to happen because there have been no elections since independence. Even in local elections, the last ones took place in 2003. The PFDJ doesn't even trust small town mayors. Newspapers were shut down in 2001 and yes. Journalists have of course been high on the list of citizens arrested and detained for challenging Isaias, the list that also includes many entrepreneurs and business owners, those that ran shops that weren't PFDJ owned and operated. Yup, into the shipping containers they went. There have even been reports of soldiers going door to door under the pretext of data collection or asking how service is going for the family, but it's really to identify draft dodgers and those who fled the country. And to flee the country, you have to get through heavily guarded borders, either through bribery or gunfire, or just see where the ocean takes you. Many times, if they catch you doing this, they'll get a family member to replace you in conscription or just arrest a family member as punishment. So God I don't damn. know. Personally, to me, Isaiah doesn't... So yeah, there is a lot of similarities to North Korea here. Like, they're just fucking... 
Yeah, you know the uh, what's the, I think it's Korea. It's the three generations of punishment or five generations of punishment or whatever it is. It's kind of a similar thing, except not as aggressive. Although, I mean, I don't know. Being in a shipping container kind of in the middle of the fucking desert kind of sounds like hell. Doesn't really seem like a stable guy. I might even go as far to say that he and the PFDJ have ruined the nation. But hey, not everything is politics. There's always the economy, right? Well, I, so I third, well. command. How is that economy? Well, it's a little different to how it works in the US or Europe or India or even China, which claims to be what Eritrea actually is. And that's a command economy. Almost everything, at least in the cities, is run by the PFDJ and the conscripts working for them. I say in the cities because more accurately, it's a dual economy. One based on government command and the other on subsistence farming. So this GDP per capita number might not be too accurate when talking about the Eritreans. In cities like Asmara, Karen, and Asab, the PFDJ rules all. I mean all. Private business is outlawed in the nation. Instead, many farms, businesses, administration, and services are run by, yes, you guessed it, the conscripts. For example, all private construction companies were banned in 2006, and the government even went so far to demolish already built homes because they were financed from foreign money by a private firm. What? The infrastructure is weak. Only a fifth of the country's roads are paved. Industry hasn't made people richer. Property rights are borderline non-existence. But hey, at least forcing people to learn how to read does actually improve the literacy rate. So that's one good thing they've done. The PFDJ and military essentially have a monopoly on all trade, construction, markets, mining, and cash crops in Eritrea. In fact, most of the trade leaving is from government-owned mines selling to China and the Emirates. Most of the stuff coming into Eritrea is a little more essential to life, especially this category. Most of the stuff coming into Wait. Eritrea is on all trade, construction, markets, mining, and cash crops in Eritrea. In fact, most... Okay, so... Their exports, 35% zinc, 28% copper, 35% gold, and then everything else is this tiny little bar down here. My god. So, uh, yeah, so basically everything combined, 2% of their economy is stuff that is not copper, zinc, or gold. Their, their, their economy is basically just copper, zinc, and gold. Most of the trade leaving is from government-owned <clears throat> mines selling to China and the Emirates. Most of the stuff coming into Eritrea is a little more essential to life, especially this category, food. Although the country claims to be self-reliant in food production, often rejecting aid, their imports clearly suggest otherwise. Forcing people to run farms they don't want to is one way to curb food production, but it might not be entire. I mean, technically, you could be self-reliant and still import stuff, right? Like, you could be... There's there's two kinds of self-reliant. Like you have self-reliant in the terms of, like, you're completely isolationist and you refuse to trade with anyone. And there's self-reliant in terms of, like, a country like the United States, for example, where the U.S. has more than enough agricultural land to feed the entire country, probably multiple times over. But they're still obviously importing foods from elsewhere, right? Like either as luxury goods or just because it's something that doesn't grow in the United States climate or is not year-round in the United States climate. Um, but that being said, I mean, with what their trade is, I, I, yeah, I, I'd be surprised if they have too many luxury goods. Entirely their fault. Eritrea is a dry country with a very little amount of arable land. Most of the food going out of the nation is a small amount of cash crops like bananas and peppers, but most of the food coming in are staple foods eaten every day. When you zoom in, most of the food production seems to be for small-scale domestic eating, almost on a subsistence level, which is where most people work. Most Eritreans do not live in urban centers. They live on small farms or pastoral land. Small villages that depend on family units instead of the PFDJ for welfare. Of course, when drought and soil erosion hits, these are the people most affected by food and water shortages. But they're also often the ones least affected by the business ban, setting up what are called micro-businesses in small towns in the cities. Basically just market stands of their crop making ends meet in the cash-based informal economy. So besides the market vendors working for cash, what do the conscripts work for? I'll let General Sabat Ephraim, Minister of Defense and Mining, explain it for me. 
Even though each of the conscripts has between two and three children, they only receive 500 NAFCA per month. How do they do it? Their reward is not a salary because the amount they receive is insane. And they make more than Cubans. Instead, patriotism is the driving force. If a private firm were to take over, it would be solely driven by pecuniary interest rather than by patriotism. In the beginning, the conscript will be happy to receive 100 NAFCA, but soon after, he will demand more. In the end, money will dictate everything. Nothing can be accomplished in this way. Patriotism will drive the country. All I mean, the irony being that they're one of the least successful countries in the world. This is the one thing I always find so funny about like the command economy people. I, I feel like half them believe their own nonsense. Like, it, it, it doesn't matter how bad command economies do. They, they, it's like a religious view to them, right? They they can't acknowledge that like their country is like absolutely a fucking shithole and everything around them is on fire and falling apart, and that you, then you, they look over at like you know countries that have market economies like the United States or you know as much as like the shit on the EU even the EU or e even China China's got a market economy despite the fact that they claim to be communist right uh, now they're, they're definitely more um, you know you have to basically be involved with the the communist party in one way or another. Uh, so it's you know a little bit more of a gray area, but they definitely lean towards more towards market, despite what they might claim. Um, and yet you have all these command economies; it's like absolute shit. And they're just like, yeah, no, this is great. I mean, like, how could you ever become rich on a market economy? It's not like every rich country in the fucking world is one. All while the ones who own the mines and businesses make a fortune off of free labor and won't reinvest the profits back into infrastructure or the people. Maybe patriotism will drive the people to work for only thirty dollars a month but it also seems to drive them out of the country in mass numbers, which has led Eritrea to four isolation. A lot of Eritreans live outside of their closed borders. One thing that means is that a lot of oh, Eritreans shit. send money back home to their families. Apparently there's a ton of them in Canada. I don't think I've ever met an Eritrean. Called remittances. Despite the whole self-reliance thing, it's estimated that around 20 to 40% of the GDP comes from these remittances. In a country with a large level of poverty, little to no pay, low foreign reserves, and food insecurity, remittances are a way for many to keep their heads above water. Maybe even to build up some savings to, I don't know, flee themselves one day. The government does try to restrict them though. A family can only withdraw up to 5,000 NAFCA in cash every month, around $330. That's not a whole lot to subsist with, so some argue remittances have not helped to develop Eritrea. They've just stabilized an unstable economy built off of forced labor. Pretty ironic for a country so insistent on its self-reliance from the outside world. Yeah, yeah oh man, that's gotta suck, because you're kind of fucked, right? It's either you don't send money back to your family, and then maybe they fucking starve because everyone's so poor. Or you do send money to your family, and then it helps to prop up the existing government, right? Which means that they're probably not going to get free from it. Another irony, the diaspora tax. Every Eritrean refugee is supposed to pay 2% of the money they make outside of the country back to the Eritrean government. It's one of only a few countries on earth to tax their citizens living outside of the nation. I'm looking at you, America. Considering how many refugees there are, that's got to be a pretty big portion of the government's revenue, right? Maybe. The government does not share their income or budget. The Hidri Trust Fund controls all state... Why would you even, like, unless... So, like, in the case of the United States... I mean, I think it's a dumb law, but it kind of makes sense, right? Most expats of the United States are going to move back. They're temporarily working somewhere else, right? So if you want to, you know, if you're working for some, like, mining company as an executive and you're in fucking, uh, you know, Uganda or some shit, I don't know, wherever there's a big mining sector, but you obviously plan on moving back to the United States, then as much as I disagree with it, I understand why you would pay your taxes. But if you're living in the United States or Canada and you're an Eritrean and you have no desire whatsoever to go back, why would you ever pay that 2% tax, right? You literally fled that country, right? You're a refugee because the country's such a shithole. Why would you ever pay a 2% tax? So yeah, here's a 2% shithole tax. 
enterprises, although no external monitoring is allowed of it. So not even the Ministry of Finance knows where the money goes. Still, we can assume this tax makes up a pretty big chunk of the budget. PFDJ run businesses don't pay tax and neither do the hard to reach rural populations. But 60% of outside Eritreans report at least sometimes paying the 2% tax and almost all said they send remittances to their families. Small scale family financing likely has a bigger impact than the government's tax collection and payments. It's a confusing system. I can't tell you everything about the economy, but I think this quote from a fled minister sums it up pretty well. In the beginning, I thought the diaspora tax was justified, but over the past 20 years there has not been a visible thing done in Eritrea. We don't know where the money goes. When I worked at the Ministry of Finance, I was involved in diaspora tax issues. The Ministry of Finance has no control over the spending of the money. It also does not control the mining income. In the end, it is the President's office and the head of PFTJ's financial affairs that control everything. The PFTJ has a lot of companies. They don't pay tax. They are like the private property of the ruling elite. Does it raise questions that most of the info we get about these systems are from those who clearly didn't like the country enough to run away? Sure. I'm sure there are some that exaggerate how bad Eritrea is to get more attention than trying to be totally honest. But doesn't it raise more questions when there is barely any information coming out of the country in the first place? Maybe it's just me, but I think I'm more inclined to believe the refugees' stories. Stories of conscription, war, command, power held by a few, and self-reliance. That's what makes people call Eritrea Africa's North Korea. Shout out to Yao for inspiring this video. If you like to read about economics, he writes a pretty good newsletter with a particular focus on African economies. Check him out if you're interested. Man, the fact they're... I mean, you're already done this video, so might as well. How, like, the fact that their economy is 98% the mining of just three minerals blows my mind. Like, that is... Wow. You need some diversification there. Like, Jesus... And also, I'm surprised that 60% of the people pay the taxes. I, mean, I guess I, want, I wonder if they're worried that if they don't pay the tax and then they're giving remittances to their family members, if the, they're worried the remittances will be uh, stolen, which, I mean, is justifiable in a country where, you, you know, you basically get... Like, uh, conscri like the conscripted out of fucking... I, I have little problem with... Uh, mandatory military service. I actually think more countries should do it. I, I'm, I'm kind of iffy on it because on the, like one hand, so many of these countries don't do what the civilians want. I'm looking at you, UK, right? You've had 15 years of voting for, well, actually like almost 60 years of voting for less immigration and not gotten it. Um, but so it would obviously be really irritating to go fight for a government that actively goes against what you voted for for 60 years. Um, but... On the other hand, I do think that you should have some degree of it in a, you know, assuming that the democracy is actually functioning properly and doing what it claims it's going to do. I don't know. I'm kind of iffy on that one. Um, but yeah, the, it's just so wild. Like, mandatory military service for like 25, 30, 40 years is just insane. Like, I understand like a two year, maybe a four year thing, but like, Jesus Christ, 40 years? Oh my God. Anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.